I date younger men. They tend to be men in their 20s. And through dating younger men, I began realizing seven or eight years ago that I was encountering an issue that would never have crossed my mind if I'd not encountered it very intimately and personally, which is what happens when two things converge. When today's total freedom of access to hardcore porn online meets our society's equally total reluctance to talk openly and honestly about sex and results in porn, therefore, becoming, by default, the sex education of today in not a good way. And so I found myself encountering a number of, if you like, sexual behavioral memes. I went, whoa, I know where that behavior is coming from. And if I'm experiencing this, other people must be as well. And being a very action-oriented person, I decided to do something about it. So nearly six years ago now, I put up on no money, so it's very basic, very clunky, a website at makelovenotporn.com that posts the myths of hardcore porn and balances them with reality. So the construct is porn world versus real world. Here's what happens in the porn world, and here's what really goes on in the real world. Now, it's very important to stress that Make Love Not Porn is not anti-porn. The issue isn't porn. The issue is the complete absence in our society of an open, healthy, honest, truthful conversation around sex in the real world, which, if we had it, would, among many other benefits, also mean that people would then bring a real-world mindset to the viewing of what is essentially artificial entertainment. So our tagline is pro-sex, pro-porn, pro-knowing the difference, and our mission is purely and simply talk about it. Talk about sex openly and honestly in the public domain, and talk about it openly and honestly privately in your intimate relationships. And the reason for that is because we all get vulnerable when we get naked. Sexual egos are very fragile. People, therefore, find it bizarrely difficult to talk about sex with the people they're actually having it with while they're actually having it. Because you are terrified that if you say anything at all about what's going on, if you comment on the action any way at all, you will hurt the other person's feelings, you'll put them off you, you'll derail the encounter, you'll potentially derail the entire relationship, but at the same time, you want to please your partner, you want to make them happy, you'll seize your cues on how to do that from anywhere you can, and if the only cues you've ever seen or been given are from porn, then those are the ones you'll take, to not very good effect. So 18 months ago, in public beta, my team and I launched MakeLoveNotPorn.tv, which is a user-generated, crowdsourced video-sharing platform that celebrates real-world sex. It's MakeLoveNotPorn.com brought to life. Anybody from anywhere in the world can submit videos of themselves having real-world sex. We're very clear what we mean by that. This is not performative. This is not about performing for the camera. It's just about capturing what goes on in the real world in all its funny, glorious, messy, silly, wonderful, beautiful humanness. We curate, we watch every video to make sure it's real, we don't publish it if it's not, and we have a revenue-sharing business model. So we are part of the sharing economy, just like Uber and Airbnb. You pay to rent and stream real-world sex videos, and then 50% of that income goes to you, our contributor, or as we like to call you, our make love, not porn star. <laughs> now, now we are, we're not porn, we're not amateur, we're real-world sex. And I want to give you some examples of what I mean by that. And I stress the word examples because we don't dictate what real-world sex is. We're putting this platform out there, and you, our community, you, the world, you tell us, you show us what real-world sex is. We are the Kawal Pamilu of real-world sex. <laughs> Utterly objective, all-inclusive, crowdsourced. But here are some of the things we mean when we say we're not porn, we're real-world sex. Real-world sex is funny. If you can't laugh at yourselves when you're having sex, when can you? Porn-world sex is not funny. Porn has parodies, but the sex in them is in deadly earnest. One of the reasons we're doing this is that we want to reassure people the same shit happens to all of us. <laughs> because we don't talk about it. Instead, we go, 
oh my God, what happened last night was so excruciatingly embarrassing, I can never speak about this to anybody ever. So, for example, the total nightmare putting the condom on. Guys, you know, you're all meant to know how to do that magic. As we all know, does not happen like that. When it doesn't happen like that, things go awry. So, you know, we, um, we essentially want a category that is the sexual equivalent of America's funniest home videos. <laughs> because when people film themselves having sex, you never see the outtakes, but there's a market for that. Imagine the sex equivalent of Charlie Bit My Finger, which has now had over 500 million views on YouTube. Imagine the appeal of something as funny, spontaneous, empathetic, and relatable as that. Real-world sex is messy. It always amuses me when people talk about porn as being dirty because porn actually sanitizes sex. Porn's very clean. In porn, nobody has hair. You never see any of those nice, messy things that happen in real-world sex. And, you know, this is very important, real-world sex is responsible. In porn, either there are no condoms, or all of a sudden the condom's on, jump cut, where would that come from? So we invite the hottest, most arousing real-world sex videos that actively compete to eroticize condom usage. What's the hottest, most arousing way you can introduce a condom into the action, put it on, take it off, dispose of it? Because we need, we all need, creative ideas about how to make those awkward condom moments hot and arousing. And if more of us had more creative ideas on how to do that, there'd be a lot more safe sex happening, a lot less sexually transmitted diseases, and a lot less unwanted pregnancies. So those are some of the things that we mean by real-world sex. Um, there's another aspect of what we do which is very unique. Um, in amongst those thousands of emails that I received, much to my surprise when this first began happening, were a lot of emails from people in the porn industry. Specifically, Generation Y in porn, millennials, 18 to 30 year olds. Because Generation Y in porn is like Generation Y anywhere else. They're entrepreneurial, they're ambitious, they're questioning and challenging the old world order and they want to be a part of the new. So I found that 20-something porn stars and porn directors were reaching out to me saying, we love Make Love Not Porn, we want to help. As a result, we have a lot of friends in the porn industry, who are helping us with our venture, we are the only place online where porn stars post the sex they have off camera in the real world. Because porn stars have real world sex too, that is completely different from the sex they have on camera, and so my straight porn star friends, my gay porn star friends, my lesbian porn star friends are sharing the sex they have in their real world relationships and talking about how that differs from the sex they perform in front of the camera. And the reason I emphasize that we're not porn is because we do not play the same role as porn. Porn is masturbation material. We're that too, very happy to be that. But what we are was best summed up by one of our members, a young man, who said to us, watching porn makes me want to jerk off. Watching your videos makes me want to have sex. We're like any other social media platform, we're about connecting people. We're about connecting people through opening up communication around sex to get to better sex, to get to better relationships, to get to better lives. In 2012, the Indonesian government decided, in partnership with the Indonesian, the Indonesian internet service providers, to block online porn sites. Um, or, let us say, to attempt to block online porn sites. <laughs> and when they did that, they blocked us. Even though our name is Make Love Not Porn, because we have porn in our name, we are blocked in Indonesia. Before that, Indonesia was one of our highest sources of traffic. <laughs> now, now Indonesia, Indonesia represents 1% of our traffic. This is a really wrong-headed decision, and that is why what I want to do in my talk today is I want to make three requests of Indonesia. Here's the first one. The average age today at which a child is first exposed to hardcore porn online is eight. And a global study done last year around the world indicates that age may now have dropped to six. 
This is not because eight-year-olds and six-year-olds go looking for porn. They don't. It's a function of what, in the digital world we live in today, is utterly and completely inevitable and unavoidable. It's a function of what somebody shows your, um, your child on a cell phone in the playground. What happens when they go around to a neighbor's house? Doesn't matter what parental trolls you have at home, your kids go other places. Um, or, because this is the most wired generation ever, and in many privileged households, an eight-year-old has their own iPad, an eight-year-old does something really cute and innocent. They learn a new naughty word and they Google it. Penis, he one or two clicks away is something they never expected to find. And I have numerous examples of this because parents write to us all the time to thank us for what we're doing. And this is happening in a world where still parents find it very, very difficult to talk to their children about sex. And back in my day, if you were one of the very few parents prepared to have that conversation, the conversation used to be purely logistical. So the conversation used to be, this goes into this, when a man loves a woman, the birds and the bees. The conversation you need to have today goes, and I'm going to tone this down from the way I normally articulate it for Indonesian sensibilities. The conversation goes, darling, we know you're online, we know you're looking at porn, and we just need to explain to you that not all women like doing those really extreme things you're watching, and actually not all men like doing that either. 99.9% .9 of parents are not having that conversation. And you need to. And so my first ask in Indonesia is social disruption. Talk about sex. Talk about sex to your children. Talk about sex in schools. Introduce open, honest sex education into the curriculum. And talk about sex generally. Because the answer is not to shut down, clamp down, censor, block, repress. The answer is to open up. And the first way you open up is talking about sex. And the second thing you do, and this is my second ask, is you disrupt the business of porn. I bring a very unique perspective to the porn industry. I bring a business perspective. It's unique not because I'm anything special, but because the people whose brilliant brains populate the pages of the Harvard Business Review and the stages of TED have no interest in turning any of that brilliance on the adult industry. And they should, because everything that worries people about porn is driven by business issues that require business solutions. Porn is like any other industry that I study as a business person. It's gotten so big, it's gotten conventional. So porn now has norms and rules conventions, which is why so much is so repetitive and boring. It's fallen prey to that syndrome that I call collaborative competition which is where everybody in a sector competes with everyone else in the sector by doing exactly the same thing everyone else in the sector is doing. And it's tanking. Its old world order business model has been destroyed by the advent of free porn online, and it hasn't invented a new one. Now, every dynamic I've just cited is also true of the music industry, of publishing, television, movies. It's just the way those dynamics manifest in porn is more controversial and distressing. The explosive growth of extreme violent porn is not driven by evil, twisted, malignant, vicious forces that work within the porn industry. It's not driven by, oh my God, we've all become more depraved and corrupt as human beings. It's driven by, very boring and prosaically, a bunch of guys, scared shitless not making any money, doing what bunches of guys scared shitless not making money do in any industry, which is play it safe. Oh look, they're all making that, let's make that too. Oh, look, that must be what makes money. Let's do that, too. As in washing powder, so in porn. And that's why the answer is to do what I and my team are doing and to innovate in business. Welcome, support, and fund entrepreneurs who want to disrupt this world for the better, as opposed to the fact that we fight a battle every single day because every piece of business infrastructure any other startup can take for granted, we can't. The small print always says no adult content. And in an Indonesia with a really interesting startup tech scene, look at encouraging healthy technology ventures designed to reinvent and change the world through sex. And my third and last ask for Indonesia is Make Love Not Porn is a global platform. Our highest sources of traffic are countries like China, India, Pakistan, countries that are particularly repressed about sex. And one of the things that we want Make Love Not Porn to do is to help countries reclaim 
their national sexual identity. Because every country has one. National heritage, national values, national stereotypes exist in sex as much as they do in other forms of behavior like cooking or eating. It's just we never talk about it. But anyone who's ever shagged their way around the world can testify. <laughs> People make love differently based on the culture, society, country they come from, or rather they used to, because porn is now homogenizing sex globally. And so I want to ask you, Indonesia, as my third request, to make doing this a point of national pride. You have a rich cultural history of literature, of legends, that are erotic and sensual and healthy and open and wonderful. Start this dialogue and manifest it with artists, with filmmakers, with poets, with writers, with the government, with the public, what are Indonesia's values around sex today? Many of us, if we're lucky, are born into families and environments where our parents bring us up to have good manners, a work ethic, accountability, a sense of responsibility. Nobody ever brings us up to behave well in bed. And they should, because empathy, sensitivity, generosity, kindness are as important there as they are in any other area of our lives and our work where we are actively taught to exercise those qualities. And so I think it's particularly fitting that I am here in Ubud. I am absolutely at the center of potential cultural disruption. Um, I would love this movement to start here in Bali. I want to ask you to take this message out to Indonesia to do those three things, social disruption, talk about sex, business disruption, innovate around it, and cultural disruption. Identify what the Indonesian national sexual identity is today, what your values are, your heritage, your beliefs around real world sex, so that you can quite literally make Indonesian love, not porn. Thank you very much.